And sort of, yeah, it's sort of what you talked about really, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing of... How many times have you seen someone come to a platform like this and you, as they arrive, you know they're not happy? Have you? <laughs> You've all witnessed that, haven't you? And um, I know I've got a different title, but I want to use this title, Show Me, Don't Tell Me. And what I find on lots of occasions is that people do tell me, but they don't show me. Um, and I'd like people, I'd like people to show me. Um, and probably the reason they don't show me is, I think in all honesty, is because it's difficult to stand up here and to talk to people. It's not something we're, it's not something we're sort of naturally comfortable with. And I often equate it to sort of speaking to an audience. It's very much like sort of blowing up a balloon. It's sort of... There's still a lot of huffing and some huffing. And, and you have this feeling it's going to blow up in your face. And then you sort of, you, you sort of get sidetracked and it starts to sort of deflate. And then you, you go again. And it's not how most of you feel about sort of presenting and speaking to groups. Is that fair to say? So it's sort of, and what I want to talk to you about is what I do, which is basically give you the tools to take all the puffing out of it. Just barely go along and nice and relax. And the thing that's really interesting is you can stop it, you can take your mind off, it doesn't deflate, it's there, you blow it up again. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about because in reality, I've listened to amazing, inspiring speakers today. And there's lots of people out there who are amazing and inspiring, but haven't got the confidence to stand up and speak. And they're the people we want to get to. And if you want to quickly talk about the young people, perhaps that's they're the people we need to sort of stand up and sort of speak. And it strikes me, one of the things that sort of reminds me of recently is we had um, the Abraham Lincoln, or the Lincoln film on recently. And it's one of my favorite quotes. I often use it when I'm talking to people about presenting, about communicating is that Lincoln sort of said, there's three requirements for a talk, for a speech, as he would say. It has to inform the mind, touch the heart, or change the will. That's what, that's what it, it does. One of, one of those three things is what it's expected to do. But yet, regularly, when I talk to people, and when I sit down and say, what do you want to say, and how do you want to communicate? They don't know. And I'm saying, well, do you want to inform the mind? Do you want to touch the heart? Do you want to change the will? And they look at me blankly, and they don't know. And where I'd like to come in then is what I want to talk to people about is I have a friend of mine who's a sports psych coach, Neil, Neil O'Brien, who spoke at the Biz Camp last a couple of weeks ago. And what Neil talks about in terms of sports psychology is when he talks to sports people, he's talking about the basics of getting the basics right. And how he explains that is, and probably the best example of if you listen to Paul Carl after an Irish rugby match or after a Munster match, he will regularly say if they haven't won, he'd say we didn't get the basics right. A scrum collapsed too often, a line-out wasn't right, you have to go back and work on getting the basics right. And if you take Rory McIlroy, he's built, he's built, two, built two greens out the back of his house, a practice area, the driving range, so simply he could practice the basics. And our thought is that the basics for top professionals is different to our basics. And I talk to me, and I play off a sort of middle handicap golfer, and he says, the basics are the same. The basics are exactly the same. You just expect less from the basics than they do. You're happy with every second golf shot being right. Rory McIlroy wants every golf shot to be right. And that's the difference, but the basics are the same. And what I want to talk to you about now, in a sense, is the basics for communicating. And I, I'm sort of not so fond of the word communicating and presenting in speeches. What I would always like to describe as it's a conversation. And the basics for a good conversation are very simple. You have to get people's attention in the first 20 words or seven seconds. You have to do something that switches them on to you right away, like do something silly, like blow up balloons, or do something, but you have to do something that gets them switched on to you. And at the end of the talk, you have to finish the talk by saying, let me tell you how you're better as a result of what I'm suggesting. Because if the audience aren't better as a result of what you're suggesting, they've no interest. What we're always focused on as speakers is what we want and how we want to sell them our product and how we want to make a sale and how we want to do this. We're never going to do that unless you can say, so let me tell you how you're better. Let me tell you how I'm going to make your life better. And then simply what I do is I give people a template 
that gets them from the start to the finish, and we choose a template that's appropriate to the situation. But it's get attention in the first 20 seconds, finish by telling people how they're better. And when I sit with business audiences and business people, and we sit down and say, it's OK, so how are you going to make people better? They just look at me blankly. They don't know because they haven't given any thought. They've given thought of what they want, but they haven't given thought of what the audience would want, or the customer would want, or whoever it is. And this comes about, how you do this is by creating desire. And I can give you all the theory about creating desire, but I can probably tell you a story that best explains it. My daughter at one stage in her career sold BMW cars. And this is an amalgam of stories that she, she told me. And she's sitting in a showroom, there's a 5 Series BMW, silver metallic paint, alloy wheels, leather upholstery, all this stuff. And an elderly couple come in, and elderly depends on your own age. So <laughs> my elderly couple is probably different from your elderly couple, but elderly couple come in, and they're looking at the car, and they're interested in the car, and they're talking to Jennifer about, they get the opportunity to take their grandchildren for a spin every Sunday, they get them every Sunday, and they bring them to the park, and they bring them to the beach, and they bring them to the zoo. And clearly, curiously, and I'm observing this just recently because I've just become a grandparent, they're much more concerned about the safety of the grandchildren than they were about their own children. <laughs> and all the conversations about, will the grandchildren be safe when we take them out? So the conversation from Jenny is that it's... also more likely to give them sweets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, oh, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and the thing that's interesting is then the whole conversation about it's a German car, it's big, strong, it's robust, lots of metal in it, it's got airbags in the front, it's got airbags in the passenger door, it's got airbags in the back passenger door, so everyone will be safe. At 12 o'clock, a, a really prosperous looking businessman, it's a man like me, looks so prosperous, <laughs> looks like he owns me, you see? And he comes in, and he's looking at the car. And now the conversation is about, what would the colleagues, what would your friends think if you turned up to the Chamber of Commerce in your new flashy BMW, or if you turned up to the golf club, what would they think? They'd say, because the business doing well, the man doing tough times, but the man's still doing well. And then at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, a young man comes in, he's in his early 20s, and he's looking at the car. And now the conversation is about, wouldn't you like to be forced away from the lights because this does all the, si all the 60 and 4.3 seconds? Wouldn't you like to be forced away from the lights? And I asked this of an audience at uh, the Junior Chamber a while ago. I said, what would you get if you pulled about Sergio a nightclub in the new BMW car? And the whole audience went, chicks! <laughs> 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 so in the morning, it's safety and security. In the middle of the day, it's prosperity and setting an image. In the afternoon, it's getting chicks. <laughs> but the car hasn't changed. The car is exactly the same, it hasn't moved. But how she's created desire has changed. So they all see the car in the way that they want to see it and the image that they want to have about it. And that's what's called creating desire. And how you create desire is you remind someone of what they lack, like, you get their agreement, and then you paint a picture of them benefiting and enjoying pulling up outside the nightclub or bringing their grandchildren to a sort of safe excursion for the day. If you do that, people will come along with you, people will buy your ideas, people will, will roam in with you in a sort of political situation or whatever it is because now you're a good communicator who's talking about what they're interested in, not what you're interested in. And that's really the sort of the interesting message about this. And the, the point where this is, is demonstrated very clearly, if you remember back to Stephen Covey and the seven habits of highly effective people, one of the seven habits of highly effective people was start with the end in mind. So regularly when I'm talking to people, I'm saying, so what do you want to happen as a result of this conversation? What's the end that you have in mind? And that's the real difficulty, is getting to work out what the end is that they do have in mind. And when we get them to there, then it's sort of all, the whole thing falls into place effortlessly. Then to prepare the talk or to prepare the pitch is effortless because it's like a journey that, that Carol talked about. We know where we want to end up. So it's much easier to plan the journey. In the same way, if you want to plan a journey, the first thing you would do is dial in the destination to Satnav. And as soon as you dial in the destination, it's do, 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 and then you're there. So now we've talked about how you end. So now let's have a look at how you begin. 
And how you begin the talk, as I see it, is you've got to get attention in the first 20 words or seven seconds. You've either got to say or do something. And um, Orla had a, her opening slide was a newspaper headline. And that's what newspapers do. When you go out this evening, when you drive up the road, there's a guy selling newspapers at the traffic lights. You'll buy the newspaper depending on the headline. If the headline gets your attention, you'll buy the newspaper. And I had this example, I came out of DCU, oh, several years ago, there was a guy selling a newspaper at, at, at the traffic lights, and the headline was Crazed Axe Attack in Dublin Airport. And I bought the paper. <laughs> when I read the article, there was some guy going through luggage, and they found an axe in his luggage. That's all, <laughs> not crazy, not nothing. It was just an axe in his luggage, probably historic or something. But I bought the paper, I sort of bought the paper. The other example of that is movies do it all the time, or television does it all the time. The news always starts, let me tell you the top stories, they give you all the exciting bit, and then they tell you. And then at the end, they sort of piece it all over again. But the best example probably is James Bond. You go in, you buy your popcorn, you buy your bottle of Coke, and before you've even started on the popcorn, and taken your first sip, sip of Coke, he's either got into an airplane that doesn't have a pilot, he's got out of an airplane without a parachute, he's rolled the car three times, there's something absolutely spectacular happened. And then you say, oh great, I'm in a James Bond movie and I'm looking forward to it. And that's what good speakers do, and that's what good communication, that's what good television does. My wife has this, I sit with my wife at home and she has this wonderful, wonderful system. I look at her, and if she's not asleep in two minutes, the television show is going to be okay. <laughs> because when she sits down, and she sits there, gone. Because a lot of them don't start well. A lot of them don't start well. I often equate having conversations with people to uh, communicating or presenting people. It's like a trailer for the movie. It should be all the exciting bits. It should be all the best bits. It should keep you on the edge of your seat. And leave all the boring bits for, sort of another, leave all the boring bits for another day. So now, We've looked at how we open, we've looked at how we close, and then regularly what I do with people is we choose a structure that gets us from the start to the finish, and we fill in boxes. If it's a technical presentation, we're probably going to use an analogy, we're probably going to use some statistics. Uh, if it's a sales presentation, it's getting attention, attention, interest, conviction, desire, and then closing it. And there's a number of templates. And the thing that's really fascinating about that is, People say, oh, but your templates don't work, and everyone will see the template and identify the template, and they'll know, and then everyone will do it. Like, regularly, I, I could pitch, say, 10 companies at a startup event and in wire for them or whatever, and say, they'll all identify the program. And then I say, what do you think about Father Ted? And was it the most um, imaginative, original, crazy, one off television series we've seen in the last 10 years? Would that be fair to say? Would that be fair to say that? Father Ted is based on the template of only fools and horses. And you go, how's that? And they say, it's a silly young guy, it's a middle-aged guy who thinks he's streetwise, and it's a jolly old guy. And you go, well, that's only fools and horses. And that's what Ray Lennon says to you. We've just taken a classic template, and we've put our spin on it, and we've hid the classic template. And he said, now, the program we're now doing, which is the IT crowd, he said, what it is, it's Seinfeld, and we've just given them computers. That's the twist. <laughs> it's two guys and a girl. And every television show you've ever looked at is two guys and a girl. So you take classic templates, and you put your own style on them, and they become yours, if you're good, when you're really good. And that's what I help, help people to be. Uh, so that's the situation. So get attention. Finish by telling how people how they're going to be better. Create a template. Now, the interesting thing is if we come back to Show me, don't tell me. And I was wondering how I'd finish this talk as I drove up today. I said, how do I get this? Because the end is critically important. <laughs> and then, thankfully, Paul got up and spoke. And is there a better example of show me, don't tell me than Paul's talk today? Mm -hmm. If there is, I haven't seen it in a long time. This is a man who was genuinely passionate, enthused about what he was talking about. Um, it was funny, I, was, I, I try to work out ways of remembering people's names. Uh, and the way I remember Paul's name was, he was appalled by things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he was passionate about it. Man, and, Paul and, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and simply I'll finish it. How are you judged when you communicate with someone or when you present to someone? How are you judged? And it's very simple. How you judge is people say, would I believe this person? And if they say yes, you're a success. And if they say no, you're not. So 
Show me. Don't tell me. Thank you very much. <laughs>